Auckland 2020 is an online series of talks from women sharing their stories about their work and career contributions across many industries and in academia. WIDS Auckland is an independent event organised by the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering to coincide with the annual Global Women in Data Science Conference. I'm Rosalind Archer, a WIDS ambassador, and I'm delighted to be sharing these inspiring talks. I'd like to thank the Woods Auckland sponsors, Gold sponsors Stats New Zealand, Silver sponsors SAS, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, Finity Consulting, Servian, Todd Digital and Red Hat. I'm happy to introduce Yalu Wen, who's from our Department of Statistics at the University of Auckland. Yalu is going to present some fascinating work on big data challenges in genomic research. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Yalu Wen. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Statistics, University of Auckland. Um, it is my great pleasure to give a talk in the Women in Data Science Conference. Uh, this year has been very different and challenging, and this is uh, indeed my first time to give a talk online, and ho hopefully everything goes all right. So today, what I'm going to talk about is one of my research projects that is related to uh, risk prediction using big biological data. Um, I'm always fascinated about data and willing and eager to use data to make data informative uh, decision. So before I talk about before I talk about big biological data that can be abstract to some of you, I will first use an example and show you how important a risk prediction model can be for uh, clinical practice. I think many of you have heard of the uh, cardiovascular risk assessment calculator. The uh, CVD risk calculator helps healthcare professionals calculate a person's risk of developing cardiovascular events in the next five years. Um, it was developed in association with 2012 absolute CVD risk guidelines. And um, cardiovascular disease is largely preventable with modifiable risk factors accounting for up to 90% of myocardial infarction. An absolute CVD risk assessment an absolute, an absolute CVD risk assessment estimates the uh, cumulative risk of multiple risk predictors to predict an individual's risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next five years. Um, it, it, what we got from that equation is we got a score, which is really um, expressed as a percentage telling you a person's chance of having a heart attack or stroke in the next five years. So this absolute risk calculator is based on the prediction equation often known as the uh, Framham risk equation. And this equation has been tested for its validity and has shown to have fairly good predictive ability. So for instance, for myself, I'm more or less in this age range and I do not have diabetes and I'm not a smoker. So it put me in this cell. And in terms of my blood pressure, I'm more or less in this range. And in terms of my total cholesterol versus HDL ratio, last time I checked, it's definitely be below four. So I'm actually in this cell. So when I look at this chart, I realized my risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next five years is predicted to be below 2.5%. So if I, think about, if I think about my dad, who is actually in his 60s, so putting him in this age range, so he does not have um, diabetes, but he is a smoker, putting him in this cell. So in terms of blood pressure, his blood pressure is in this range. And in terms of the uh, total cholesterol level versus HDL ratio, and his score is about five. In other words, he's falling in this cell. So when I look at this color and I realize the risk for him to develop a cardiovascular event in the next five years is, be is between 20% to 25%. Apparently from this chart, which I downloaded from the Ministry of Health website, what we can see here is the risk factors that we've considered here include gender, diabetes status, smoking status, blood pressure, and total cholesterol level versus the HDL ratio. So these are the factors that we use to predict the CVD risk. So here is the uh, corresponding clinical guidelines. For instance, for myself, uh, who has less than 5% of chance to have a CVD event in the next five years. So when I visit my GP, the advice that I'm going to get is very uh, general advice. 
just basically uh, telling me how to stay healthy. But when I think about my dad, whose risk is actually here, which is be between 20 to 25 percent, he may uh, he is going to get some very specific guidelines in terms of lifestyle intervention. And on top of that, depending on the results from the other test, he may need medications. So apparently what we can see here is the clinical practice the GP uh, do is actually depend on the risk, uh, the estimated risk. So apparently for some diseases with modifiable risk factors, if we know the risk or if we can predict the risk fairly accurately, we can act early and identify subgroups of the population who are at high risk. We can design precise treatment for people who are at high risk, and obviously we can reduce mortality and morbidity uh, for that particular disease. So let's just take one step back. So in order to build accurate risk prediction models, we need to be able to use data smartly. So currently for most of the prediction models, we more or less going to focus on demographic variables such as age, gender, ethnicity, uh, smoking status, blood pressure, et cetera. But we haven't really considered the information at molecular levels that can be more relevant to the disease progression and prevention. So recently, due to the advances in uh, biotechnologies, we have collected massive amount of biological data at various molecular levels. For instance, right now, we can collect the uh, whole genome sequencing data, we can collect the uh, epigenomic data at the whole genome level, and we can get the transcriptomic, proteomic, and metabolomic data. So as we know that human diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cancer, are caused by multiple genetic factors and environmental factors. So he, and we also know that human genomes are uh, actually fairly complex and they are regulated at various molecular levels. Well, apparently each of these data offers a peak of this complex human system, but in order to build an accurate risk prediction model, we need to make use all the relevant information here so that we can predict the outcome. And on top of that, these data, uh, they tend to be uh, interdependent. So indeed, the ideal way for us to make a risk prediction is we can use all the relevant information and we can take the inter complex inter and interrelationship among them to make a better prediction. So indeed, if we only look at one level of the data, we may miss the entire pictures. For instance, in this case, if I simply touch his nose, I might say, ah, it's a snake. If I simply touch his legs, I may say, ah, it's a tree. But only upon you look at this giant animal as a whole, you realize, oh, this giant animal is indeed is an elephant. So if you think about the multi-layer data that we got right now, is if you, we only look at one level of the data, we may or may not get the complete picture. So in other words, in order to really uh, model these uh, big biological data, we need to be able to look at them as a whole. So to best model the complex and the big biological data, we need to know the nature of the data that we have collected, and we also need to know the challenges that we're going to face. First, the, big, uh, the biological data that we got nowadays are really, really big. For example, the genomic data is going to have tens of millions of predictors or potential predictors. And similarly, for the whole genome methylation data, we're also going to have millions of potential predictors. So in other words, if we only look at each of these data by itself, it is large, it is, hi, it is high dimensional. And apparently if we look at them as a whole, they are, they have, they are even more uh, high dimensional. And on top of that, for these big biological data, the signals there are extremely sparse. In other words, we have a whole lot of uh, noise in our data. Indeed, for our big biological data, the majority of the variables there are actually noise. Secondly, the data that we got here is really heterogeneous. In other words, we have heterogeneous data types. So if we look at the genomic data, it, which is usually coded using the number of minor values, in other words, it is usually going to be a categorical va uh, variable taking values 0, 1, or 2. So if we look at the uh, methylation data, which is usually coded as the uh, probability of a uh, particular CPG site being methylated. In other words, it is a continuous uh, variable bounded between zero and one. 
So if we think about um, gene expression data, which is really continuous, um, but depending on the technology that you're actually using, it might be discrete count. So anyway, if we look at these data as a whole, we do have ketogenous data types. In other words, we may have categorical variables, we may have continuous variables bounded between zero and one, and we may have discrete count. Thirdly, for big biological data, there are complex intra and interrelationships among them. So if we look at this figure here, so this is the standard biological process. And on top of that, we do have some back regulation process. So only upon we can consider this complex system as a whole, we can predict the phenotypes more accurately. So um, as a data scientist, given the data that we have collected, we need to think about the appropriate or sensible way for us to model these data. When I think about this problem, I use the idea that individuals with similar profiles at the molecular level have similar outcomes if these molecular features and the outcomes they are associated. So let's just look at this example. Suppose that we're looking at the beta globin gene on chromosome 11. So from here, what we can see here is people carrying T alleles, they tend to be healthy individuals. Whereas for people who are carrying C alleles, they tend to be the pe people who have disease. So in other words, if we look at these pairwise similarities, these two individuals, they are going to be more similar. Similarly, these three individuals, these three individuals, they are going to be more similar. When we look at the phenotype similarity, and apparently these two individuals, these two healthy individuals, they are going to be more similar. And similarly, these three diseased individuals, they are going to be similar. In other words, if this gene is really related to the outcome, we would expect the genetic similarities is going to lead to phenotypic similarity. So if I put these things in a mathematical form, so if I use kernel functions to summarize the pairwise similarities for the genetic data, here I use kg to represent the pairwise similarity for genetic data. And similarly, I use a kernel function to represent the pairwise, uh, to calculate the pairwise similarities in terms of outcomes or phenotypes. This is my KO here. So if the genetic data has nothing to do with the outcome, I would expect these two, they are perpendicular of each other. Otherwise, I believe this genetic data does have some information that can help me to predict the outcome. So indeed, one of the nice things for me to use kernel function is upon transforming these individual predictors into a pairwise similarities, I've actually solved two problems. First, I've actually changed the heterogeneous data type, heterogeneous data, into more homogeneous similarity measure. Secondly, upon transforming each individual predictors into similarity measure, I've actually reduced the data dimension substantially. So for multi-layer data analysis, similar idea also apply. So here, what I did here is I first um, developed a kernel function that transformed these individual predictors into similarity measure. To be, uh, to be uh, specifically, I calculate the genomic similarity, epigenomic similarity, transcriptomic similarity, proteomic similarity, and metabolomic similarities. And then we're going to use some uh, kernel fusion algorithm where we can fuse these similarities into an overall similarities for each gene. Because as I mentioned earlier, for big biological data, the majority of the variables are not really related to the outcome. So if we think about the human genomes, roughly speaking, we have 20 K genes. And for a particular disease, only a small proportion of them, they are going to be disease related. In other words, the vast majority are not really related to the disease. So that's why uh, I, develop, I develop a variable selection algorithm so that we can select the genes or the similarities that can really help us to make prediction. So if we really look at this figure, this red um, gene is the gene that, that is related to the outcome. When I try to make a prediction, when I try to predict this individual, it is nothing but a weighted average of the phenotype from the other three individuals. And the weights here is really depend on the similarity. So in other words, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to use the genetic similarity to predict the outcome. So the basic assumption that I use here is if the genetics, if these uh, genetic variables, they are related to the outcome, I would expect genetic similarity will lead to phenotypic similarity. <clears throat> 
So, so far by using this idea, I've actually reduced the dimension of the data substantially. And also I have transformed heterogeneous data types into more homogeneous measure. But there is one thing that I haven't really saw. In other words, how exactly I'm going to integrate these information into an overall similarity measure. So for big biological data, we do have some annotations and meaningful ways of grouping them. For example, we have already grouped the predictors based on their genomic locations. We can also group them based on, say, pathways. As predictors within the pathway, they tend to have some certain relationships. And predictors from different pathway, it's quite unlikely that they're going to have a joint effect on the outcome of interest. Okay? So that's why here, what I can do is I grouped my predictors into pathways, and then I transform them into a similarity measure. Uh, one of the nice aspects of doing this is I can actually incorporate prior biological knowledge into the similarities. In other words, at the end of the day, the interactive network that I got here actually have the information that I have directly in my data. And on top of that, I do have some prior knowledge incorporated. And these prior knowledge can also help me to make a better prediction. So I think um, many of us have benefited from the development of deep learning algorithms. For example, convolutional neural network and the recurrent neural network are widely used in various image and speech recognition tasks. Similarly, they also have great potential to be used for big biological data modeling. However, one of the uh, big challenges for big biological data is their high levels of noise and relatively small sample sizes. Different from image and speech recognition tasks that usually have high signals and a relatively large sample size, the signals in the biological data are extremely sparse and simultaneously consider billions of variables with huge amount of noise is actually an extremely hard task. Indeed, rather than just take each individual predictor as its own, I can use the same idea that I just presented. In other words, I can cut the genomes into chunks and then try to summarize the information within each pathway and then build prediction models. So here again, I use genomic data as an example. Suppose I first cut the genomic data into gene annotation, and then I'm going to build my prediction models based on each genes say here using convolutional neural network. Um, in terms of variable selection, we can use variable dropping and those kind of techniques to help us to select the genes or pathways that are related to the outcome. And indeed, this is one of the projects that I'm currently working on. And um, the preliminary, preliminary results suggest this way of uh, building risk prediction model seems to work. And I'm waiting to see the results from the real data analysis. Anyway. So what I'm going to show you today is the results that I got from the analysis of any data using the whole genome sequencing and the gene expression data. And in terms of the analytical approach, I use the multi-kernel learning algorithm, uh, just, which is the approach that I uh, presented earlier. So uh, the any data here is that the uh, Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. It is a large scale longitudinal study that collect and utilize various predictors of Alzheimer's disease including 3D brain imaging, cognitive tests, and genetic data. On the sample that I got here, we have 808 individuals with various disease status at the baseline assessment. And I group my genetic variants um, according to the gene annotation. And then where, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to use the whole genome sequencing data together with gene expression data to predict the PET imaging outcomes. So this is just one set of the prelim preliminary results. Here, this, uh, this color shows the uh, prediction from my method or the multi-kernel learning uh, algorithm, whereas this is the standard practice. So what I, I have to say here, indeed, the accuracy from the new method is still fairly low. Um, in other words, it can't be used for clinical practice. But what we can see here is indeed, by improving the algorithms, we have the ability to improve risk prediction models. As you can see here, compare with the prediction accuracy here versus the standard practice, we can see here the prediction accuracy actually improved substantially. So currently, um, I'm waiting to see the results from the uh, deep, deep, deep learning algorithms, and hopefully, um, 
they did a better job because we all know that neural networks uh, have the capacity to capture the nonlinear uh, relationships and hopefully that can further improve uh, risk, uh, the accuracy of rich risk prediction models. So my research work is mainly founded by these founders and here are the uh, references that I used for my talk and thank you. <laughs>